Today, we're going to be speaking with Mark Tushnet, who is emeritus professor at Harvard Law School and also a specialist in U.S. and comparative constitutional law. Uh, it's so great to have you on. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. So I guess to get into this conversation, uh, there's been significant debate over the last few months since the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg about uh, the correct number of Supreme Court justices and questions like whether there should, for example, be a term limits for Supreme Court justices. But there, there's another approach, and that's one of questioning whether we really even need or, or should have a Supreme Court. So, I mean, let's let's just start there. What do you believe the purpose of the Supreme Court was originally and does it still fulfill that purpose? Well, the basic idea of the court was uh, uh, that you needed some body uh, that would be able to enforce uh, the provisions of the Constitution. Uh, um, you could expect politicians to debate the constitutional issues and reach compromises and so on. And so uh, politics might be one way of making sure that uh, people adhere to the Constitution. But uh, um, early on, people started worrying that politicians might um, find it in their mutual interest to do something that was inconsistent with the Constitution, to uh, agree on oh, some program that uh, gave the president too much power. Sure. Or m more likely that we, of what we think of today, uh, enact programs that violated individual rights. And the thought was you could insert a court into the process so as to to check against those possibilities. And at this point in time, is that number one still necessary? And number two, is that the primary activity that the Supreme Court is engaged in checking that? Well, on the, the second question, no, actually, it turns out not. The primary thing the court does, things that uh, don't get as much attention, um, is interpret statutes. Uh, tell, you know, Congress passes a statute, uh, it's got some provisions in it that aren't clear, uh, and, and the Supreme Court comes up with an authoritative interpretation of the statute. Um, on the first, um, I think it's, it's a tricky question about whether the court is um, now either needed or doing too much in terms of uh, enforcing uh, constitutional provisions. Uh, the reason it's tricky is that we now understand that there's a lot of, I would put it this way, reasonable disagreement about what the Constitution actually means. Um, and it's, everybody thinks they know, uh, the Constitution prohibits things that they don't like happening. Uh, but it turns out that it's very difficult to uh, say that very often legislatures or Congress or president um, actually do things that nobody could fairly say are consistent with the Constitution. Occasionally they do, once in a while. But most of the time what the court's doing is saying, you have this interpretation of the Constitution. It, maybe it's a reasonable one, but we have a different one, and we're going to stop you from doing what you think is consistent with the Constitution. Uh, so in terms of, uh, yeah, no problem. So in, ter in terms of if there were no Supreme Court, is it is it as simple as the 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 next lowest court's decision? It becomes the final decision. Is it that simple or is there more rearranging that would need to be done? Well, you'd probably want to do more rearranging. I mean, what, if it were, if you just took the court out of the process entirely, uh, then you'd end up with uh, the possibility of a court in California saying something's constitutionally okay, and a court in Massachusetts saying it's not okay. Yeah, uh, that's not impossible. I mean, you can live with a world like that. 
but it's sort of awkward. We think it's our constitution. Um, so you probably, if you take the court out of the process, you probably want to uh, take the lower courts out of it as well. And how would you do that? Would you establish some kind of a well, I mean, I won't I won't even pretend to know how you, how you would do it. How how would it be done? What would what would be the way that you would rearrange that process? Well, my preferred solution would be to say, yes, we can still keep the courts involved uh, for reasons that I'll get to in just a moment. Uh, but they should apply a standard. We could even write it into the Constitution that they should hold things unconstitutional only if they are, my phrase is, manifestly unreasonable. Uh, and, and that sharply reduces the uh, degree to which the courts, any court, could uh, uh, could intervene in in constitutional interpretation. It would still give them some role, but only for extreme cases. In terms of the more common reforms that are sometimes mentioned or changes to the court, um, uh, things like changes to the process by which by the mere chance or timing of who is president at the time that a vacancy is created, changing that. So it's not just uh, the, the whim of whether there's a Republican or a Democrat in the White House, changing the number of justices on the court, putting term limits uh, for uh, being on the court. Do you do you like any of these, all of them, none of them? Um, so I'm in favor of of any program that's likely to have some effect on reducing the role of the court in our political life. Okay. Uh, people, the most popular thing the, of the things you've mentioned are term limits. And um, I'm, I've signed on to a term limits proposal. Um, people who favor them do think that if you have sort of a regular process of um, arrival and departure, then the stakes for each uh, appointment will go down, and that might lower the uh, uh, willingness of the court to get involved in deep uh, political matters. The appointment process would be more routine, less highly politicized. Um, I think that might happen. Um, uh, the, the, the expanding the size of the court, which is also something I currently favor, uh, um, would temporarily actually uh, make the court more prominent uh, because people would focus on, on, well, they've just, you know, expanded the court to change the rulings that right. are coming out of it. But people also seem to think that eventually there'd be some sort of uh, uh, equilibrium where first Democrats expand the court, then Republicans expand the court the court and eventually people come to understand that that's not a terrible, terribly great way of doing things. And what you really want to do is, uh, again, lower the temperature uh, of uh, the court's activity. And so you know, they, people talk about reducing the legitimacy of the court. I think that's basically a good thing. Uh, and so if court expansion had that effect, that would be OK with me, too. When it comes to um, the idea of uh, and I know that the, this is sort of a different different question, the idea of constitutional originalism, which is a, a very, very big debate to me, there's a few elements that that sort of don't pass the sniff test that are very often mentioned. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. One is if we're talking about constitutional originalism as thought at the time of the Constitution's creation, when we talk about bearing arms, we would have to account for the types of arms that existed at the time and recognize a lot of what's available today would be out of scope, even even theoretically imaginable at the time. When you talk about cruel and unusual punishment, what we have today is is dramatically different than what would have fallen under that definition at the time. So how what is your sense in terms of this debate around originalism? which is often put forward by those who seem unwilling to concede some of these points on cruel and unusual and on the Second Amendment that I've brought up? Uh, I think we have to distinguish between two kinds of originalism. There's the originalism that academics have come up with. OK. Uh, and uh, 
academics have a decent account of uh, academic originalists have, have come up with a decent account of the Second Amendment problems and how we can deal with them uh, and the, the cruel and unusual punishment provision and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, uh, equality for women uh, is a you know significant uh, matter. Um, so the academic theory actually has a certain amount of uh, credibility. But then there's the practice of originalism by judges who say they are originalists. And that's sharply different from what the academics say. And it's entirely inconsistent. Uh, they are originalists when uh, the results they come up with uh, fit their mostly conservative ideology. And then they depart from originalism when they haven't figured out how to defend their conservative positions in originalist terms. Um, the best example of that, incidentally, is affirmative action. Um, uh, there's, there's just no, uh, uh, no credible, I should, the academics have a credible way of defending or of attacking affirmative action uh, uh, on originalist grounds, but conservative judges haven't even bothered to try. They just think that it's inconsistent with some fundamental principle of equality that they're committed to without trying to link that principle to original understandings. OK, this is good because it adds a level of nuance when we hear those who are not particularly well educated on this br bring up this issue of, of original intent in order to defend some of their conservative ideals. So when we talk about constitutional originalism, you're pointing out there is judicial constitutional originalism and then there is academic constitutional originalism and that these are two different things. And as you're putting forward the idea that academic constitutional originalism does deal with some of these apparent contradictions, maybe we could dig into one of them, like, for example, on Second Amendment and the idea of what arms referred to hundreds of years ago versus the, the weapons available today. How would the academic originalists sort of uh, deal with that? So the academic account is actually, there are two versions of the academic account. One is um, tied to what we mostly think about these days. And it is, uh, you say, you have to think about the kinds of weapons that people had in mind that were understood to be covered by the Second Amendment. Right. And when they thought about and talked about the weapons that were covered by the Second Amendment, they referred to weapons that everybody has access to, or in the current phrase, weapons in common use. And so now you translate that to the current circumstances and you ask what weapons are in current use today. Um, so. So weapons in current use then were muskets and things like that. They're not in current use now, but ordinary handguns are in current use. Um, on the other hand, bazookas are not in current use. So you're making an analogy. In other words, you have to you have to think of what was what would be analogous to those weapons today. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Exactly. exactly. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Sure. Um, the other way is much more radical, and actually, I think my own view is. Uh, more connected to what was actually going on. Um, the original understanding on this second view of the Second Amendment was that it was a way of ensuring that ordinary people would be able to uh, fight against uh, an overreaching government. Uh, they would be able to arm themselves, to protect themselves, not against criminals, right. but against you know, soldiers. Um, and given what the military has today, that would imply a very, very high, a loose standard for what it would right, mean for yeah. exactly. And, and no, no contemporary defender of the Second Amendment, except people associated with you know, these Michigan militia types uh, want to go there. Um, and so the judges uh, say, well, we don't. You know, they may have had this original understanding about what was called the insurrectionist view, uh, 
But, but that's not what we think the original understanding was. Uh, and they do that precisely for this sort of um, uh, um, um, instrumental reason, uh, ends focused reasons. Uh, they don't want to say people have a right to have bazookas or anti tank weapons. Right. Now, it seems like you could apply a similar standard to this idea of cruel and unusual punishments, right, where where you would say, well, just because there are things available now that weren't available then and some of the things that were done then have gone out of style, we have to sort of evaluate what is analogous at this time. Right, right. And and uh, and here, in fact, um, again, the academic position is, yeah, that's right. And it might be that in particular capital punishment or uh, um, life imprisonment without parole for juveniles, those might be inconsistent with the fundamental ideas that were understood to be written into the cruel and unusual puni punishments clause. And again, what judicial originalists do is they abandon the originalism and they say, well, look, the text says capital crimes. So whatever they thought cruel and unusual punishment meant, they also thought capital punishment was constitutionally permissible. Um, and, and so again, you see this inconsistency between the practice of conservative judges who want to uphold capital punishment and um, originalism as it might be coherently worked out. Ab absolutely fascinating. I think the big takeaway is no matter what you call your philosophy, there is still debate to be had in figuring out exactly how we define it and, and different versions of it. Uh, uh, that's right. I mean, uh, I think the, the again, I'm an academic. The academic view of these debates is that uh, with relatively minor exceptions, um, Whatever your theoretical position is, um, you're going to be able to fit your current political views into it. Um, and that means that the theoretical stuff really isn't, really isn't doing any serious work. What's going on is you're a liberal or you're a conservative, and that's how you rule. Yes, uh, very well described by by behavioral economists, in fact, like Daniel Kahneman and and others who have talked a lot about that type of uh, motivated reasoning, which clearly exists within the issue of, of constitutional scholarship as well. Uh, we've been speaking with Mark Tushnet, emeritus professor at Harvard Law School. Uh, professor, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. I so appreciate your time. I, I enjoyed it and appreciate being on.